Welcome to Coffee with the Candidates, Round 2, The Road to the General. This second portion of the program will feature candidates vying for public offices in the Guam Legislature, the Attorney General's seat, Congressional Delegate, and the top seats of Governor and Lieutenant Governor of Guam. Democrat candidate Sabina Perez and Republican candidate Stephen Guerrero join us on this episode of Copy with the Candidates to share their views as to why they should get your vote for a seat in the 35th Guam Legislature. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Candidates. Phil Leon Guerrero from News Talk K57 here, and I'm joined with the Democratic Senatorial Candidate, Sabina Perez. Hi, day. Hi, day, Phil, and hi, day, Guam. Um, I'm so glad to be here today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm running for senator. I'm number two on the Democratic ticket. So, Sabina, um, I the top placed non-incumbent finisher on the Democratic ticket, one of the top ones. How did it feel to have such a successful primary as a first-time candidate? Um, yeah, it was a surprise to me. Um, and I think it goes to show that um, the network's in place. Um, you know, I, I basically had a lot of MAGA hagas behind me <laughs> doing the phone tree, so I'm so appreciative of them and all the people that, that, that put their trust in me. Uh, I'm very humbled by their vote, and I'm definitely going to be responsible and work hard to, um, you know, work for the public interest. We talked about, you know, I, I, I try not to pigeonhole you as a candidate because I think it does a disservice to, uh, you know, what, what you're trying to do, uh, getting into the, the Guam legislature. But a lot of observers have noticed that there is a particular segment of our community, those who are concerned with sustainability, cultural preservation, respect for our historic resources that really have come out in strong numbers, maybe stronger than we've seen in elections in the recent past. Um, do you think, do you, are, are you seeing that as well, that maybe people that felt that they didn't see representation of their values, their ideas in our government, in our elected leaders, are rallying behind candidates like you because it does give us hope that when we say representative democracy, that we will be represented, that they will be represented in our government. Um, yeah, I believe so. I mean, absolutely. Um, people want to change, and uh, now is a great time because uh, we're seeing the, the greatest amount of vacancies in office mm -hmm. uh, in the legislature, um, and uh, hopefully, you know, through the work that you know that I've done uh, on the nonprofit side. Uh, we've empowered the community, and this is something that I would like to see more of is the community involvement um, to help make the change. And uh, part of that is the part of that is going to be at the ballot box, but we definitely need to partner with the community uh, to make change uh, a reality. I think uh, if people knew you before you announced your candidacy, it was probably around an association with Protehi La Texan, Save Ritidian. Mm -hmm. um, how are those issues about? being concerned with plans for the marine relocation from Okinawa, um, making sure that when we talk about development here on Guam, that it's responsibly done, mm -hmm. that it's with respect to our history, respect to our uh, cultural heritage and those important resources that are priceless. How is that going to translate uh, to your approach as a local lawmaker if mm -hmm. the voters elect you in November? Okay, so one, one of the things on my platform is social entrepreneurship, mm. where uh, you combine business with addressing uh, environmental and social issues. Yeah. And it's great to see even young people get into this. So there is a, a young young man, he started a company called MISA, which, right. which um, basically um, you know sells uh, metal straws, reusable metal straws, in place of throwaway plastic straws. And imagine the impact that will have on our, in our environments. And we need more people uh, to take up the, you know, to help um, improve our environment through the business aspect. Um, so that's what sustainability really is. It's about combining the environmental, uh, economic, and social needs of a society. Um, uh, in addition to, uh, as far as what I'm interested in doing, is mm -hmm. also uh, we definitely need to in increase 
uh, the monitoring that's occurring. Um, you know, for instance, I was in, I was in the news recently about the Nova spill, mm. how the company took uh, um, spilled 100 gallons of jet 100 mil, 100 gallon 100 million gallons of I was at 100 millions uh, hundreds of gallons of, of jet fuel into our waters and they they took a delay they were delayed in um, reporting that so we need a greater um, uh, enforcement we need greater uh, monitoring that takes place with these construction companies to prevent any kind of damage to our environment and to our health ultimately I think that's a sentiment that a lot of people should be concerned with that sometimes uh, in the reporting models that we have right now, um, we don't know about something happening until it's too late. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's about what's called remediation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about collecting a fine. Mm -hmm. And um, I hear sometimes, especially when we take into account our history uh, from 1898 to now, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the people of Guam are sort of left holding a bag with mm -hmm. a mistake that's made mm -hmm. and and you know there, there's not much to do about it. Right. Um, a lot of that has to deal with federal territorial relations. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, as a local lawmaker, how, how are you going to approach trying to make sure that these multi layers of government of mm -hmm. oversight uh, really work out best for the residents here? Yeah. So there, there are there are possibilities um, okay. because not everything happens uh, on controlled property, mm. right? DOD controlled property, right. and it, and we're not just talking about DOD construction projects. We, this also would include local projects. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, yeah, uh, you know, the workers are not not all housed on base. Mm -hmm. uh, potentially, we could look at, at that that angle of, of how can we uh, hold hold these corporations accountable. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just so much research to be done about this, and I feel we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. Of how we can, um, you know, potentially get revenue from from hundreds of millions of dollars that are going into these contracts, and uh, not one of that is seen in our own coffers. Um, we we've talked about, you know, that that if we if we focus on the military buildup, I mean, we could be talking for another mm -hmm. three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, mm -hmm. uh, just because of how much has been studied, because of how much has been uncovered, uh, because of uh, how many things uh, people find as far as shortcomings in that mm -hmm. process. Okay. But since we only have a few minutes mm -hmm. left, I, I wanted to ask again to try and mm -hmm. not pigeonhole you as mm -hmm. a single issue sure. candidate. Um, what else is on your legislative agenda? What else are you trying to bring to the 35th Guam legislature? Well, you know, we have a cri we have crises going on in our government from the fiscal crises mm. to the GMH, uh, to environmental crises, and we have a social crisis on our hands with suicides. So, um, you know, I'm definitely going to work hard to uh, look at how we can uh, regain the public trust, uh, making sure that we as a government can provide the services that people depend upon us for. And the way to do that is to ensure accountability uh, and fiscal responsibility. So that's part of the sustainability platform as well. Um, and you know, really, to me, the, the big thing is economic development. And we need to make sure we need to increase this. And I, I feel that, um, we, you know, I have I have a lot of ideas about how we can um, create a, a flourishing society. I mean, if you look at Japan and Singapore, they're one of the richest countries in the world, and they don't have as much natural resources. How do they do that? It's because they're human resources, and we need to look to our people as a valuable resource that we can develop to create an economy that can, that can sustain us here on Guam. And but we have to also make sure that our, our environment is not harmed. Um, uh, so we can see the benefits all around, and I believe we can make this happen. And the government, we need the support of everybody in, in the community, in the business sector, to make this happen. You know, government is not going to answer all the problems, and we need to form these partnerships with the people on island. Uh, we're do we're taping this on a little bit of a delay, but I wanted to recognize that Sabina just came back from a youth voter uh, registration drive at, uh, that happened at DOE with a partnership with the Election Commission. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it in this campaign for you to galvanize young voters, an underrepresented part of our electorate? Well, I think it's important for the youth to understand that their voice matters. I mean, if you look at the past election, it was only 100 votes that se separated the winner uh, of, of the gubernatorial election. Mm 
Um, and not only that, their voice can help shape future, the policy of the future of this island. Um, and uh, every vote counts. Um, and and it, it's not, uh, their, their power, we wanted to empower our youth. Yeah. And it's not just at the ballot box. I mean, they can even run for office eventually. So, and change policies and, and be an instrumental part in changing policies. And um, we, you know, I believe that our youth have so much ideas and innovation that can help promote the Guam that we want to see. Sabina Perez is a Democratic senatorial candidate uh, coming up for a vote in November. Uh, do you want to give out your social media? How can people learn more about you? Okay, so yes, I have uh, Facebook, Sabina Perez for Guam. Uh, and then I also have a website, sabinaperez.org. Um, and um, you know, feel free to, to access them and ask me any questions. Um, and thank you so much, and I'm looking forward. And I, I, um, I humbly ask for your vote on November 6th. I'm number two on the Democratic ticket, Sazuas Masi. Thank you very much for yeah, joining you, us, Sabrina. Uh, Sabrina, really appreciate it. Uh, we will be right back after this. Welcome back to Coffee with the Candidates. Phil Leon Guerrero here, and now I'm joined by Republican senatorial candidate, Steve Guerrero. Half a day, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Phil. So I think that the voters may have, um, I, I guess, familiarized themselves with your name. You've been a candidate several times. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's driving the persistence to be a senator or a mayor? I think that was the most recent um, office you ran for. Well, you know, Phil, in 2010, I ran, I, I did run for senator. Um, uh, and uh, it was just a passion of mine to, to give back to the people of Guam. But the, they gave me such an illustrious career in the government. Um, when I ran in 2016 as the deputy mayor, it was also a continuation of that passion to give back to the people of Guam, more, more particular Dedido, simply because I am from Dedido. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was just that continued passion that drives me to where I am today and wanting again to run for senator to serve the people of Guam. Um, you said uh, prior service in, in the government. Do you want to let our audience know sure. um, what that prior service is and what you've been able to accomplish? Yes, Phil. Um, I, I retired on the Bureau of Budget after 36 years uh, there. Um, I also was uh, a director of the Department of Labor uh, back in about 2003. Mm. And uh, after that, I just kind of like was in retirement mode for the last six years. And all of a sudden, people are saying, you know, Guerrero, why don't you try running? You know, I think the government needs your expertise. They need your, your, your support. Uh, they need just your institutional knowledge to, to help, I guess, the government get back on track. More particularly, it's the financial situation that the government's in. Mm. Um, a lot of that experience you laid out is in the executive branch. Yes. You're running for a completely different mm -hmm. branch of government. Mm -hmm. um, What's your approach going to be as far as lawmaking? Mm -hmm. um, because it is different than, you know, sort of executing policy. You know, Phil, it might be a different branch of government, but the work basically is the same. Um, as, as bills are passed or introduced in the legislature, and they're actually formulated and passed through the legislature when it comes to the government for signatures, we actually, at the Bureau of Budget, review these, these bills, mm -hmm. and, and we actually make comments on them. So the, it's, the work itself, it's not new to me. Um, basically, government is, is basically the same. Um, it's just three branches of government executing different, um, their purpose is actually a little bit different in each branch of government, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's still government of Guam. Well, I, I guess the point of the question was, you know, sometimes you get senators who introduce these pie-in-the-sky ideas, mm -hmm. and you always think of, well, how are you supposed to pay for it? Absolutely. And over at BBMR, mm -hmm. as you said, that sort of is your role to uh, examine bills and mm -hmm. say, this is the practical cost Absolutely. for what you're about to ask us to do. Yes. And I, I guess there would be a benefit to having someone ask those questions mm -hmm. before it gets to BBMR, because mm -hmm. a lot of the times after it gets that fiscal note, which mm -hmm. is what it's called, yes. um, the what can be accomplished changes different. It, it changes drastically mm -hmm. because um, there isn't enough money to support the full vision of the program. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I wonder if this is a, you know, if, if the approach will be not just big ideas that can't be accomplished, mm -hmm. but more, you know, sort of measured uh, solutions with a fiscal reality in mind. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, Phil, um, when we review these bills as they come through the budget office, uh, one of the most important things we do is, is the feasibility of the funding source that's being identified in these bills. Historically, uh, a lot of times that the bills uh, identify funding sources for whatever projects that, that are being proposed, they're not really viable sources. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what causes a lot of financial disruption within the government's finance. Or empty promises. Empty promises, if you call them empty promises, yes, but you know, when it comes to the bill, we need to focus more on, on, on the intent of the bill, whether or not we feel it's something justified or not is immaterial. Our job at the budget office is to make sure that the funding is there mm -hmm. and it is a viable source to make, to, that the appropriation being made within those bills are somewhat realistic and achievable and not just empty promises type bills. Um, with the, well, I, I guess with that in mind, mm -hmm. understanding our fiscal realities and, and what we can accomplish mm -hmm. with, uh, with them, I, I wonder how you are going to approach the current sort of um, choppy fiscal waters that the government is dealing with. Come January, you know, when, the, when we'll have a full year to appreciate these Trump tax cuts mm -hmm. and the impact it has to our local treasury, when people start filing their new tax returns that have the additional ACTC figures in it, how are you going to be able to approach one of the very basic and important functions of the legislature, and that's crafting the budget? Well, I'll tell you what, um, for me, you know, the whole purpose of the Trump uh, tax cuts was actually to stimulate economies, yep. to put money back into the hands of the consumers, uh, to give them more disposable income, therefore um, generating more taxes. But it's going to take time to do that. Um, as far as being physically responsible on the local level, I honestly believe that um, Governor Guam, for me, over the years, I believe is very healthy. Uh, we collect, gosh, over $1.3 billion basically in revenues a year. We appropriate maybe anywhere from 600 to 700 million for executive branch operations, which is mostly all the departments within the government of Guam. What my biggest beef, and that, that has always been my big, biggest beef, is fiscal accountability. Okay. If we appropriate money at a certain level, then departments and agencies, especially certifying officers, are bound to stay within those levels being appropriated. So you ask the question, if we appropriate $100 today, and at the end of the year, they spend 110, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Where's the accountability? So you go back and you say, well, gosh, uh, Department XYZ, you, only, you were only supposed to spend $100, and you spent 110. Who authorized the 10 extra dollars to spend? That's where I think that the government needs to be more responsible and clamp down on these type of, of, of expenditures. Because every year, the biggest problem with the government, as far as its financials, is the unappropriated expenditures that are killing the government. What, what are some examples of these unappropriated those type expenditures? Of, those type of expenditures are expenditures that are paid by the government that is not appropriated for those expenditures that fiscal year. And so in other words, it carries over. How, how big of a problem is this? Oh, it runs in the, in the tens of 15, 100 million dollars over the years. So up to 100 million dollars mm -hmm. of taxpayer money is spent on things that the legislature didn't approve? Over time, uh -huh. what, what, it what, accumulates, is, it what accumulates is what I'm saying. Some years it's 10, some years it's 20, some years it's 50. It just depends. But at the end of, say, a five-year period, you add up all those, those deficits, it's going to amount to $100, $200 million. And you, you ask the question, how can the government get $200 million in debt when you're already pegged every year to spend X amount of money? Right. Accountability has been missing and has been missing in the government for years. When I think of financial accountability, something else that comes to mind too mm -hmm. is the government over the course of the past six-ish years mm -hmm. uh, has gone from a $600 million budget to about a $900 million yes. budget. And I'm wondering as a taxpayer, mm -hmm. as a consumer, as someone who is now paying more out of my pocket mm -hmm. following these Trump tax cuts, do I see a $300 million improvement in services mm -hmm. that I'm paying for? 
And I don't know if I can quantify, mm -hmm. but I do think it's not like a automatic yes. And I wonder, you know, are you also going to try and hold that level of accountability as far as asking for more money out of us? Mm -hmm. There should be a translation to a delivery of something. Absolutely, and, and, and that's a very good question, good observation. For me, you know, what I, what I like to do is I like to ask the general public, Everybody always has this tuition that Yomin and Guam is too fat, it's too heavy, it has too many people. I'm saying there are areas in the government of Guam that can be trimmed, and you can cut the waste, you can cut the fat. And there are places in government of Guam that are dying. And revenue tax needs more people to collect more money. Yeah. And if anything, if there's any agency out there, it should be revenue tax that we should be, we should be appropriating money for because they're the generating agencies of this government of Guam. They collect almost 90 percent of all revenues the government of Guam um, generates. But yet, it's lacking people. It yeah. lacks people in motor vehicles, it lacks people in, in, in real property. Those are the money-making agencies, I mean, money-making areas within the government of Guam that every year, right now, they're talking about 20, 30 million of uncollected real property tax, a 90 million of uncollected um, income tax. Mm -hmm. People owe. And yet, if all that millions of dollars are out there, why aren't we doing anything to collect that? Rather than to keep going back to the people and taxing them here, taxing them there. You know, to, to me, it just doesn't make sense. What I'd like to also you know, explain to the people is that I would like people to come up to me and tell me, what services do they really want? But more important, how much are you willing to pay for those services? Sure. And once I determine that, and once it's a collective agreement among at least the majority of the people, it gives me a little bit more sense to how to go in there into the budget and start attacking it and cutting where needs to, where I, I, I believe needs to be cut, where the excess lies, where we can actually maybe cross-train employees in different departments to do different functions rather than to having a, a full body, um, you know, uh, fill a position which is really not needed. No such thing as a free lunch, but if you're going to pay well for it, you at least should be full. Um, uh, we're, we're running out of time, Steve. Okay. Uh, I know that we spent a lot of our, our, our allotment here mm -hmm. on uh, fiscal issues. Yes. So if you wanted to real briefly, maybe two or three not fiscal issues that are on your uh, agenda, your legislative agenda. Absolutely, mm -hmm. Phil. You know, um, for the good part of my adult career, um, even my youth career, I, I've been very involved in sports. And mm. my sports, youth sports especially, is very close to me. I run the Little League program. I've been running it for the last 15 years, but I've been involved in Little League for the last 40 years. Um, I'm also involved in the, the, the end spectrum of, of life when I deal with the masters, the older folks, you know, the 40 of, of, um, of helping those folks uh, uh, try to achieve, you know, their, their, their physical well-being. So I, I also like to, when I get into the ledger, push the agenda of, of, of really developing sports on island, both for the youth and for the elderly. Well, Steve Guerrero is a Republican candidate for senator. Uh, what number are you on the ballot? I'm number 14. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us on Coffee with the Candidates. We will see you next time.